Hello there. So anyway, today I'm going to be talking about Shangri-La, the anime. It, I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'm just going to say I didn't really like it that much. Uh, basically, my main problem with it was it kind of set my expectations too high for it. And that's actually pretty much normally a good thing. It's great to have high expectations, but it's worse to kind of leave you hanging with those expectations. Because it starts off naming all these things, and if you know anything about a little or a little bit about Japanese culture, you know that they really do care about the environment a lot. And so the first episode has like all these terms thrown around, like carbon tax, and you know it really seems like it's going to be an environmentally focused anime. And then a lot of those terminologies kind of disappear for the most part. Like, they're thrown in occasionally. It's like, oh yeah, remember those words we used, like, maybe two or four episodes ago? And then they throw it in, and but it doesn't really hold any weight to the overall plot. So that's really overall my problem with this series. It's just that it kind of makes you think it's going in one direction, and it just completely goes into kind of schlocky, actiony act territory. And that's not necessarily a horrible thing, but it doesn't do no anything new with what it is doing. And that was my main problem with it. For example, like, it has the typical... I was actually listening to a podcast a couple of years ago, and they were talking about how a lot of anime that was coming out at the time was being mostly um, strong girl and normal guy. And that's not necessarily new to anime, but... They were talking about how there was a trend of just a lot of shows that coming out during that period of having that kind of trope. I think another great example would be Shakaga no Shana, and uh, possibly even, um, what's it called, uh, Blood Plus. So yeah, you can kind of see where I'm going, or at least the examples that you can draw from that. Anyway, so... It follows in that similar vein where there's this one girl who can do almost pretty much anything and nothing will really, nothing negative will happen to her. And, you know, that's fine, you know. You kind of end up wondering though, is there something special about her? Like, can she, is she magic or made of magic or genetically de designed? What's her secret? You know, some hair products? <laughs> but um no so it kind of you're just wondering the whole time and then like 10 episodes in they explain it away with like two lines of dialogue by saying that she some other girl and some guy are all genetically designed or computer designed or something like that it's never really explained in great detail I don't know if that's the the fault of the dub or at least just the story itself and but that's the thing is when I mentioned earlier of Supergirl and Normal Guy, um, that Normal Guy is one of those three people that were genetically designed, and he's just a completely normal schlub, and he doesn't really do anything. He really didn't even need to be there. There was one point where I was thinking, like, okay, so is he just there for the male audience when he becomes her love interest, or what? And there's actually a line, you know, a little bit earlier when they before they find out that they're computer whatever program people and they're asking him so is there any hot girls at home for you and he says oh no there's no one and then it cuts to her and it's like okay so that obviously kind of implies that maybe there's something going to happen but then nothing ever comes of it at all so it's very obvious that the girl is the main character and basically really her only remarkable feature was having a big boomerang and the boomerang does different or vary in sizes from time to time um by the end of it the only time where it's actually justified for how big it is is at the uh, last or second to last episode where she has a boomerang maybe three times her size you know and but that time they at least say oh yeah we just got a special order boomerang for you and that's the only time where, you know, they're like, oh, that's why the boomerang is so big and she's so small. I mean, it really seems to be justified up to whatever the artist was drawing at the time. Anyway, so as I was saying, the story takes a lot of leaps and bounds. And it, and I mean that in time in terms of where it's going. Like, 
you, you're not really ever sure where it is going, in a sense. Uh, it starts off with uh, basically poor people living outside of a giant, I don't want to say floating city, but it's on structures, so, you know, it's kind of floating and it's supported on metal beams or something like that. Anyway, so that happens, <laughs> and there's automatically that kind of, you know, dichotomy of poor versus rich and things like that. But again, nothing really comes of it in a meaningful fashion. It, overall, the the point of it having a uh, the city being supported by you know metal beams is just to show that you know rich people live there and it's supported by an evil corporation, and that's really it. Like the corporation really doesn't do anything evil necessarily. It has a prison. But, you know, where else are you going to put criminals? <laughs> and it really only seems like the prison is for women. <laughs> so, and specifically young girls. So juvenile female delinquents who have been committed of a crime. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, that's the only evil thing they really do. And then, you know, the other kind of evil thing they do is they're building new homes inside their floating city, or metal supported city, but they're not building them fast enough for the poor people living outside. And it's like, okay, you know, that's a real problem, but, you know, should you really be angry at them? Not that I'm saying they should be angry at themselves, but it's kind of like saying, ah, oh, jeez, these people who are doing this nice charitable thing for us aren't working fast enough. Those bastards. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? It's kind of like being mad at FEMA for them not helping people fast enough. And I mean, you know, if there is an actual, like, it's never actually shown them being, you know, completely, you know, slacking off or being like, oh, let these peasants, you know, swallow, wallow in their own filth for a little while longer. No, it actually shows them being constructive and actually working towards solving the problem. But the thing is, you know, the poor people are just complaining, you know? So really, when you think about it logically, there really is nothing to be mad about. When you, but since the story is shown from the perspective of the uh, poverty-stricken people, you know, you empathize with them more. But then when you actually think about it, you know, the corporation's not that bad. They're trying to help, but you know, Things don't happen like that, and so that's kind of the problem there, at least in terms of the storytelling. Now I know it was originally written as a manga and then tra uh, transferred as to an anime, so uh, whenever I see that, because I have, there was actually one um, anime, or at least manga that I read and then saw the anime, and I noticed a lot of it that they dropped a lot of plot threads or whatever, or subplots and things like that in order to make it fit into the anime. Even though it was 26 episodes long. So that kind of made me think that was what was happening here with Shangri-La. was just that there was a lot of plot and a lot more going on in the manga and they just kind of dropped a lot of it on in the anime. Because the anime is only 26 episodes long and the manga I believe was going for about 10 or 4 years I know that's a bit of a leap, you know, 4 or 10 years but at the same time you can write a lot in that time frame so that's kind of my guess of what happened I really don't know, maybe if you've read the manga you can you say almost the opposite, you know, if that's what you feel but that's just how I felt and took the story but moving on one thing I think the story does actually well is it has a transgendered person in it. Although I believe she's a post-op uh, transsexual. I, I liked it, you know. It, it was a great, um, I, I don't want to say visualization, but I <laughs> it was a great um, character because really her gender had nothing to do with what she did. It, you know, it was just, you know, here's a person they have these traits and is in no way related to their sexuality or physical being, you know. So I thought that was nice, but at the same time, you know, it was kind of, again, pointless in a sense. You know, they didn't do anything with it. It was more, it was kind of like having a 
black person who just goes to work and pays their taxes and doesn't break the law and tips at restaurants you know and they're making a point of it like saying look it's a black man going to work and paying his taxes and tipping at restaurants you know it was kind of like that in a sense except you know make the transsexual uh, a uh, sort of Indiana Jones character now, I only say that because she has a whip she doesn't really do anything else comparable to Indiana Jones after that so anyway moving on yeah that was pretty much it, not really. Uh, eventually, they find out that, you know, the corporation... I guess this is kind of an evil thing, but again, it wasn't really planned. It was just sort of accidental. Apparently, the evil corporation was designing plants, and they sort of turned into weeds and would shoot spikes at people. But that wasn't necessarily their intended purpose. <laughs> so... Eventually, they start growing all over the place, and you know, as you can imagine, plants that shoot spikes at people don't make for great living spaces. So the plan is to bomb the eight places where they are infested, and that's about it. And so the corporation is kind of like, "Oh, this isn't our problem," you know, even though they designed it. And I mean, I guess they could have just said, "You know, all right, it's our problem. How can we help?" I mean, that's the thing. And eventually they do kind of get to that point, but the way they help is just by letting people sit in their city for like an hour or so while they bomb the outside. And so that's the thing is like, it doesn't really like do anything. Like they're trying to help. They're At times they're very helpful and at times they're kind of, you know, they're so, um, what's the word? There's a phrase actually to kind of describe them really and it's something along the lines of do not suspect malice when incompetence will do and you know as you can say see I think that really sums it up quite well and even still it doesn't even have to be incompetence it could be apathy you know it, they don't have to care <laughs> so really they're not that evil it's just they're not doing anything evil either so that makes so they are evil by default in that kind of story logic sense anyway the plot really meanders a lot like i remember there's a point where they're going to invade uh, indonesian islands to shut down this virus that's on a server and then their ships get blown up by a satellite that was hacked by the virus and again it doesn't really go anywhere because I believe eventually the virus is destroyed, but that's like towards the last episode, last two, last three episodes. And again, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, the point of the virus getting out of control was just for it to be out of control. It doesn't really do anything other than that in terms of it's just destructive. And at some point, it's later revealed that the main big bad character uh, she was maybe kind of in control of it, kind of, <laughs> and that she actually is also a robot, computer, program, cyborg, whatever. Um, it's weird, I believe they state that she's a robot or computer image or something like that, but then when they kill her, she turns into a 900-year-old corpse. So, whatever. Translation problem, perhaps? I don't know. Whenever there's something where the... I've just noticed this a lot recently. I, I actually just finished watching Razafon. And at times I would watch the dub and uh, then subtitles because the version I was watching didn't have uh, subtitles for letters. And sometimes the dialogue would be different. And it's kind of just made me kind of think that recently is that whenever the dialogue does not match the uh, visuals, that probably something's wrong with the writing just a bit, or at least what the actors were told to say. So anyway, moving on. Yeah, overall the anime, it, it kind of left me empty. It didn't offer me anything new. Like, it was nice to see, you know, a capable young woman, but it, it, she wasn't really capable. She was capable because the writers wrote her to be capable. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? It wasn't like... She, I think a great example is when Momoko, the transsexual, uh, gets captured and uh, they're thinking, how do we rescue her? And then she's, they're like, well, she's like, I'm thinking of a plan. 
and then like, well, it's not like we're just going to storm the place, right? And then she's like, uh, now that you mention it, let's storm the place. And then, you know, that's kind of the problem is just that it's sort of just so, un, you know, her luck is more of a superpower than necessarily can be believed in that sense. And that really she relies on it too much that it goes past the point of believable believability. I mean there's lots of t there's actually I believe a point where she jumps off of a plane to onto a bomb or a missile and disarms the missile and jumps off as it explodes and then gets caught by someone or something and then flies to safety or falls to safety. And you know of course there's no laws of inertia and I know that's a very common thing to fall 400 feet, but as, as long as a j big giant metal robot catches you with their hands made of metal, you will be safe. <laughs> so I know that's a very common thing, but at the same time, it's just something where it's playing in the back of my mind. Like, you know, falling, it hurts when you fall on the ground. <laughs> so that's just overall my big problem with this series. And eventually it doesn't really go anywhere. You find out like, oh, there's these characters that have kind of a backstory in the sense that like there's a woman who keeps being reincarnated through shrine maidens that are sacrificed to her. But at the same time, it's just like all these things that are just kind of almost needlessly thrown in there. And the pe it's almost as though they're jigsaw pieces that don't quite fit. It's not that they're completely incongruous to one another, but it's more like they kind of rub up against each other, but they don't really make sense in the grand scheme of things to the point where they kind of interlock. So, really, that's just how I felt about the series overall. Um, I don't know. If you're interested in uh, physically strong women, although she's not necessarily physically strong, it's just that she can run really fast and jump from really high heights and fall on the ground with not without breaking her legs. You know, if you're interested in female characters like that, then I think this would be a great series for you. Um, I didn't like it because the action didn't push the story forward. The action... It wasn't as bad as this other anime movie I saw, something called Koronoku, I think it was, where the action was just straight up for the action's sake. It wasn't as bad as that, it was at least tangentially related to the plot, but at times it was just kind of like, well if you stop and think about it for a moment, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so that's really how I felt about the series overall. Um, positive things I could say about it, I, I, I don't know, it, it, it's not completely horrible, it's not as bad as an anime movie. I hate most anime movies, so, you know, yeah. That's I don't really want to start a flame war of that because I know there's a lot of people who like them, and but my problem with most anime movies is that they have a lot of action that is mostly there to kind of show off for the fanboys, and so that they can probably put it in a trailer, and that's it. <laughs> and this was not as bad as that, but it was to the point where it was like, all right. It wasn't even like this fighting is going on too long. It was just, you know what's going to happen. The girl wins. So this fight is useless in terms of storytelling. And they're not, they never divulge new information between the fights. Like, Luke, I am your father. It's always just like, hug, hug, I'm going to get you. No, you won't. Hiya. And then she wins. But it's stretched out over maybe three or five minute fights. So that's kind of the problem, I think. Anyway, I hope you, you enjoy it if you decide watching it. It's not really too horrible. The animation quality is quite high for the year 2013. So, you know, hey, if you enjoy it, that's great. And I just didn't like it for my own personal reasons. I didn't, the story kind of let me down and it didn't seem to be like it was going as high or as far as I had. Anyway, enjoy!